Welcome to PCS with Military.com. I'm your host, Amy Bouchatz, Military.com's executive editor. On this podcast, we talk with experts and insiders about everything you need to know to make this military move season your best yet. Now, let's get this PCS started. There are a few people out there who are the reigning experts of their field. They are the people who everyone points to for problem solving. The people who know them and work with them or simply know someone who knows them or works with them consider them to be the be all end all of help in a particular area of expertise. And here on PCS with military.com, we've done our best to find those experts in various parts of PCS problem solving and bring them to you. Carrie Mendoza is exactly that kind of person when it comes to relocating pets and animals as part of a military move. A Navy veteran who grew up in an Army family, Carrie knows the stress of moving with the military. And as an animal lover and dog mom, she also knows how important it is to keep the whole family, including pets, together. That's why she founded the Hawaii-based Island Pet Movers, which helps military families relocate their pets worldwide. Today, Carrie is going to share her best insider view and tips and tricks for moving as a complete military family. Carrie, welcome to PCS with Military.com. Thank you, Amy. Thank you so much for having me. This is such an important issue that is going to never end. It will continuously go on forever and ever. Um, I can attest to that for being, you know, in my mid forties and I've been moving with the military since I was three years old and uh, pets are always part of that move. (laughs) Yeah. So how many times have you moved with or without the military? So I calculated this up. I just sit there on my hands and fingers and, you know, as a military kid, I don't remember where I was. I don't remember how old I was when I was somewhere, but I remember everything based on where I was and what grade I was in. So I counted that up and it's been, uh, I've moved 21 times, I'm not counting local moves within the same city, but 21 different um, cities or countries that I've lived in. And uh, I've been in Hawaii now for 13 years. So this, this is the most cumulative time I've lived in one state in my entire life is Hawaii. And you're in Hawaii and I'm in Alaska. So these are two very different locations on a different episode of PCS with military.com this season. We have me in Alaska talking to someone in in Italy and someone else in Japan, if I remember correctly. Sam, we've, we're so international that I've lost track. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so how did you get involved in pet shipping for military and civilian families? How did this become your area of expertise? So in 2008, I used to live in the California Bay Area, and I was a land development project manager doing uh, new home construction and land development and new home construction. And with the housing market crash in 2008, I found myself on one Wednesday where it was a sunny, beautiful day, and I thought life was great. And all of a sudden, I didn't have a job two days later. So over a period of time, over the next year, life completely changed. I had moved to Thailand for a little while. I loved living in the islands, but I was ready to be back in the United States. And I was back, I came back to home to California and my best friend, um, whom he and I uh, were stationed together in the Navy and his wife and I became just dear friends. I could see, I consider them brothers and sisters of mine. And he had, was in Iraq and they were getting stationed here at Schofield Barracks. And I was sitting with April one day and she was just beyond stressed about moving her dog to Hawaii. And I was just watching the stress she was dealing with. And I looked at her and I said, gosh, you know, this is, you're dealing with governments and, and you're dealing with permitting processes. And the entire time, actually, I was in California, which was seven years, I competed in dog sport. So I competed in international dog sport with my German shepherds. And I had traveled with them throughout the country and internationally. And I had done some courier servicing for some of our, some of my competitors who were unable to take their pets to Europe back and forth. So I was familiar with pet travel and also with moving our pets because as a military kid, you know, we change schools every year and you lose your friends, not every year, excuse me, every PCS, you know, you lose your friends, you lose your schools, you lose your teachers. But the one thing that always remained consistent was our animals. And for my mom, um, you know, that was just, it was something that was never an option when we were in E5 back in the eighties. And I can't imagine what the income level was back then, but I tell you, my mom always said to my dad, like the pets will come. So, you know, we've moved back and forth to Germany with our animals when I was a kid. And so as I was watching April kind of struggle through this, and I I just kind of started putting pieces together. And I said, 
you know, would you pay somebody to do this work for you? And she said, yeah, absolutely. And so I said, well, maybe I'll join up with you guys over in Hawaii. You know, I miss being in the islands when I was in Thailand and um, maybe I'll put this together. So I joined up with them. They were stationed at Schofield and I got here on island. I started up, I sat down and every night she would say, you're in front of the computer all day. And I said, yeah, I'm building a business. Hmm. And uh, I built my website myself. I did all my permitting and everything myself for my business. I didn't even know that pet shipping was an industry until about three months later when I started looking for insurances and I came across the IPADA organization. And then I reached out to the IPADA organization and I said, wow, other people actually ship animals too. And so um, I started, I started Island Pet Movers and it was definitely dedicated around helping military families, keeping their pets together because I know how difficult the struggles can be. And our company has grown tremendously in 13 years, but the core value of what we do hasn't changed since day one. So you mentioned an organization, IPADA, I think is the acronym. Can yep. you tell us what that is? So IPADA is the International Pet and Animal Transportation Association. And IPADA is a member group organization of pet shippers worldwide. Um, the organization doesn't necessarily, they don't dictate what each individual company does with their servicing. What they do ensure is that each member who is a member of IPADA is licensed. They're insured. They're following local jurisdictional laws as far as handlers for animals and maintaining your, your licenses within the jurisdiction of the country that you're in. It does give us a great network of other professional shippers all around the world. And not only that, like a lot of these pet shippers are colleagues and they're dear friends of mine for many years. Um, but it's really nice that I know that I can call to a pet shipper who is in you know, a foreign country and I have all um, faith in them that they are going to absolutely take care of my client's pets. Mm. So if my client says I need delivery to Kaiserslautern in, in Germany, I know I can call two of my colleagues at two different companies that I have intimate um, knowledge of what it is that they do. I know them personally, and I know that I can tell my client that their pets are going to be in good hands. Do they create an industry standard that families should be looking for when choosing a pet shipper? Yes and no. I mean, there's an industry standard that we all need to uphold in order to be a part of IPADA. And that's as long as it follows along an ethics line. Um, there's also like the live animal regulations that we all have to follow and maintain our standards of shipping. Does that mean that everybody who is a member of IPADA is going to be the best of what it is that they do? I can't attest to that. I think that there are members of IPADA who are definitely specialized in certain areas of what it is that they do and they all kind of have their each individual area for that ipada does not they do not oversee directly any particular company they don't oversee pricing they don't oversee schedules uh, ipada members are actually not supposed to discuss pricing amongst each other because of u.s business relations and laws mm -hmm. and price fixing you know scandals so what is that industry standard that people should be looking for then I think the biggest thing is that when you're looking for help from, from a pet shipping company, and also I should reiterate, there are pet shipping companies out there that for whatever reason are not IPADA members. And that doesn't mean that they are not a good company. Some members just choose not to, not to join IPADA. It could be that they may be just a small company in a small area, but they are really good at what they do. They just don't want to pay the fees and become a member. Um, <clears throat> But one of the biggest things that I, that I like to say to people is that if you're going to use a shipper, reach out to somebody who's in the country that you are going to be departing from. And that's because I cannot book flights for somebody who's departing out of Germany or Italy or France. I would have to go to my client, my agent, my colleague in those countries, and they would have to make the bookings for me. So if the pet owner needs assistance on the arrival side, like here in the United States, absolutely, we're happy to help with that. But if they say, hey, like, I don't need those services, I'll handle clearing the customs ourselves, then I would have them just go directly to the agent in that particular country. So they're not utilizing um, and paying for services of a middleman. Some of our clients really want that. They want ease, they want one bill. They just say, hey, Carrie, I worked with you in the past. 
you move me to Germany. I just want to move with you coming home. And that's perfectly acceptable as long as they are aware. We like to try to make it very uh, transparent that we will be working with another shipper in that other country. And there will be additional fees for that, for the facilitation of that. So that's something that, you know, that you could keep at. And again, word of mouth is, it's huge. So if you're asking your neighbors and other fellow families that are in your command of who it is that they use and what were the services that they provided and do you need all of those services? That's kind of, you know, what people should look at and comparing, you know, apples to apples when you're getting quotes from different agencies, you know, what is it that they're including in that? What are the pieces that maybe you don't need in that? Some pet shippers will require that you have door-to-door service because that's their business model. But some of the clients, they don't necessarily need that. So it's always asking, do you require these services? Do you require that I use your agent to clear customs? Everybody's going to be a bit different. Some people do it for control purposes. They do it for um, just keeping, you know, making sure that they're not going to have issues. You know, we know that if I use a particular agent in Frankfurt to handle the clearances and the home delivery, I know that there's not going to be an issue that my pet owner has to deal with. But at the same time, I also know that the majority of my pet owners who are military are looking to ship more on a budget. And so we don't require that you have to use an agent for those clearings. Those are more just a, as a benefit, as an extra benefit, if that's what they need. Okay. So you mentioned budget, right? Military families move a lot or they tend to move. It can be very expensive even without trying to ship a pet or move the whole family together like that. There's a lot of controversy over why the military does not help pay for moving pets. Uh, If they pay for other quote unquote household goods, are they considered household goods? Why don't they get moved as well? If they'll move your hot tub, why won't they move your dog? So I'm, I'm wondering what changes you think as someone who is an expert in this that the defense department needs to make? What do they need to do to make this easier on families? I mean, I think all of us would love to see the government, you know, the military decide that pets are family members. And I mean, you have, uh, there are a lot of, of active duty military who don't have children. So if they're, you'll move a child, you move all the child's furniture, et cetera, et cetera. But to some people, you know, this German shepherd is their child for mm-hmm. whatever reason, if it's a choice or if it's a, a physiological issue, that's for the frustrations for me. It, would it be great for the military to recognize the um, psychological impact of animals and what they contribute to the military family and how that contributes to readiness of the military? I think that would be amazing. But, you know, I don't get to make those decisions. I, there's several things. I also feel that if, a, if an airline takes government contracts for flying military personnel, and they're willing to, to, you know, they've got those rates and the government is paying for military families to fly on that airline, that they should be required to take military pets, mm. regardless of weight restrictions or breed restrictions. As long as there is safety of the animal, that is the main concern. If they are taking taxpayer dollars to move our military families around the world, they should be required to move the animals as well. Yeah. It's yeah. the same on the AMC, right? So this weight restriction, I get it. And unfortunately, it comes back to unions and what the liability for the unions and the handling is, right? So that's where this 150 pound weight restriction comes from. It's union handling. But there are other ways of facilitating these moves, in particular on wide body aircraft. I mean, the pets can be put onto um, a pallet and then they're loaded on a different part of the aircraft. So it is an additional handling. But again, that's part of moving a family and moving a service member. You do the steps that are necessary to get them where they need to go. Mm -hmm. That's just me though. It makes it sound so easy to just implement these things. And there's all this bureaucratic red tape, but you know, for me, when I look at it, it's like, this shouldn't be this hard, but it's a frustration (laughs) for sure. So one of the other frustrations in in a world of frustrations around this issue, right, is that people are receiving last minute orders that there's only so many spots for pets on these AMC flights going overseas. Those fill up really early. Anyone who's ever traveled knows that last minute travel stuff is more expensive than well-planned travel stuff. I don't care what you're doing. So I'm wondering if you have advice for these military families who need to arrange last minute travel or prepare so they can travel with their pets on itineraries that they don't have yet. So (laughs) what do they do? 
So, and that's a good thing, you know, and it's, and it's always been like that, right? It's always hurry up and wait. And all of a sudden it's like, you're going to, you're going to Germany. And then three days later, oh no, we're going to Japan. You've been going to Germany for six months and you're all excited. And it's like, oh, sorry, you're going to Japan. There are some circumstances you'll never will be able to really plan for. But one of the big things is that, you know, you're going to move. Eventually you will move. You are a military family and this is what you do. I mean, you might get lucky. I've seen people who were stationed here in Hawaii for 15 years. Good for them. But that's not the norm, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're consistently planning for that, and, and one thing, you know, that um, people will reach out to us and, and they say, I don't know when I'm moving. I don't know what, you know, what date do you want me to put on here on the contract? Our contracts are always an estimated date because we get it. So not only am I, you know, prior military, grew up as a military brat, almost all of my employees with the exception of two are military spouses. And so we literally, we get it. Like we, they've all been there. We all absolutely understand this. But one thing that, that I think people take a bit for granted is that the ability to have the pet shipper on your side for when you do need to pivot that mm. if you plan to always have them in your back pocket, they can help you get through a lot of the, um, the nuances of moving, even if you do get on the AMC, even if you are able to fly your pet as excess baggage, but we are the logistical experts in what it is, everything to do with pets. So for us, we take a deposit on our contracts and that deposit is, that's for us starting our service. And that's going to give everything that we need to do to help you move. If it, for some reason you end up getting on the AMC, like we're clapping, we're happy for you because we're not making our money on the airfare. That's not where, that's not where our time is covered. Our time is covered in our deposits. Our time is covered in, in the preparation that we're getting with you and with your pets and, you know, helping you to get your pet accustomed to crates, being in the right crate. I mean, mm. the number of clients that don't have the proper crate and you know, show up and they're trying to get their pets on the AMC. That's still very stressful. It's stressful when you're, you know, in Seattle and you're going to Japan and it's very limited. You miss that flight. You may not have another flight. So right. if you miss the flight because you don't have the proper crate, well, now you may have to hire a professional pet shipper to get you where you need to go. So there are a lot of things that pet shippers can do that help you, even if they do not facilitate the actual flights for you. We have a lot of clients that end up taking their pets in cabin. So again, that airfare is not something that we're charging to them, but they are still paying for our expert guided services to help them get where they're going. And I think that's something that's really important that people, they reach out to business mentors, they reach out to finance mentors, they reach out to realtors for help when they're moving somewhere. And a lot of times people forget that pet shippers, we're here to help you along the way, not just physically get your animal on a plane and get them to their final destination. Right. Right. And that makes total sense because I don't do any part of my military move completely on my own. When I'm moving my pet, we own two dogs, a small one and a big one, you know, mm -hmm. it's like the odd couple. And, and were I trying to move them overseas, this would be a huge stress for me. These dogs are part of my family and we'd want to make sure that they got over there safely, first of all, affordably if possible, but mostly safely. And those pieces of that process are not something that I know anything about. So then I'd be scrambling to figure it out and just on and on. If that was my household goods, not my dogs, or if that was my home, I wouldn't be doing those things without some help. I'd be mm -hmm. have, hiring someone or like a real estate agent for a home or a management company or something and figuring it out. So it makes perfect sense that this is a thing that you can lean on someone for help with. You know, th and the biggest thing is a lot of frustrations. I'm obviously in a lot of chat boards and a lot of frustrations I consistently see are, I've been on hold for seven hours with this airline and I got, I was transferred five times on this airline and this person told me this and this person told me that. And what you get with a pet shipper is that we are the industry. People reach out to me from airlines to ask me, Carrie, what is going on with this? What is the policy on this? We've helped airlines to um, write their pet policy. I've had major airlines that have reached out to me and say, hey, what do you think about this? What is your input on this? Does that mean I've written their policy? Absolutely not. Have I had a bend of their ear? 100% I have. And so when somebody says to me, you know, I see this frustration from people that 
you know, the, the person at this company told them this, and then they, then they told me, never mind, it's this. We already know all that. We've done it. We literally do this all day long. That's all that we do. We know when there's a change with the airline because we're airlines are industry partners of ours. So we know when changes are coming up before they're made public. And when there are certain changes that happen that the public may not even know, like all of a sudden bulldogs have been canceled on this particular Mm. flight, or you can't fly on this. We know immediately the workaround. And that's what you're getting with the pet shipper is that you're getting somebody who is able to pivot when we need to pivot. And that pivot could be uh, like a couple of weeks ago, we had a big flight out of Guam. And we had 27 animals that were flying from Honolulu to Dallas. And the pets all landed here. We cleared customs. We got everybody potty breaked and we're cleaning out crates. And I get a phone call from American Airlines that says, hey, snowstorm in Dallas. All the flights are canceled through the weekend. Mm. This was on a Tuesday. So 27 animals, we're having to halt, pivot. What are we going to do? And we're on the phone and I've got different airlines. I've got management and airlines to understand what it is that we're dealing with immediately. And I said, hey, I need it. I need help with this. Can you help facilitate this? And between those connections with the, the management at those airlines, we got all of those pets with the exception of three that had to stay through the weekend, moved the same night and got them back on track where it was that they were going. Right. right. So that's what you're getting with the shippers. You're getting relationships, you're getting inside industry information. And not all of us are here just to, like I said, we're not making money on putting your pet on a flight. Again, I can't attest to different companies, but my company itself, we really truly want to help families keep their pets together. And we're going to do whatever possible that we can to help you do that. Even if that's saying, hey, maybe you should buy your own ticket on a commercial airliner because the military's flying you on an airline that doesn't allow animals. However, if you look at this airline, which is cheaper and you can fly as excess baggage, you're able to move your pet and you're going to pay out of pocket, but ultimately you're going to save. Those Mm. are things that we walk through with our clients that they're getting as part of the services that they hire us for. Just a quick break here to tell you about all the incredible PCS and military life resources on military.com. Did you know Military.com's team of news reporters and experts put together the news and information you need to make your military life the best it can be? And you can get all of it delivered straight to your inbox by signing up for one of our newsletters at Military.com. And the Military.com news app, available for iPhone and Android, will keep you on top of breaking news as it happens. What are you waiting for? Check those resources out today. Now, back to our show. Most of the discussion around shipping pets is around dogs, sometimes around cats. Uh, But of course, people have all sorts of different animals. So what type of pets are more difficult to ship than others? Or are there any pets that you recommend families do find foster homes for rather than trying to bring them Oconus, even though that's obviously not the preferred answer? But is there any pet that falls into that category? So we see, I think you see dogs mostly because of, with dogs, you have so many breeds of dogs and so many restrictions in relation to those breeds. Over 30 of the most common breeds fall under the AVMA's restriction for brachycephalic, which is like snub nose. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, over the last six or so years, that's become like increasingly more and more difficult to ship. So I think that's why you see more dog issues, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And then mixes of those. So then it's like exponential, like the number of animals that are challenging to ship, but really what it comes down to. So between, you know, the brachycephalic dogs and um, extremely large breeds, it's going to be the exotics, right? So if you've got reptiles, I mean, I know I used to have a snake. I joined the Navy and I had to find somebody to take my snake. I was sad. My mom was like, no way, but you can't bring them to Hawaii, right? So there's no, there are no reptile imports to Hawaii. So the exotics really tend to have some problems, um, not problems, but more challenges, difficult, or just not at all. You know, birds, particularly with CITES permits and imports for dealing with endangered species type of permitting that's required, African greys. I mean, birds can live, outlive their owners. That's something that, you know, you don't want to leave a bird. I mean, birds, again, we've grown up with big birds and and they are extremely um, become part of your family, right? And you talk to them and they talk back to you, but they can be very challenging and very expensive. And in some countries, not able to be moved absolutely at all. And so... 
the solution there is for family, well, for military members or family members to either give them away as you did with your snake. You, I'm assuming you did oh. not get your snake back. <laughs> I did not get my snake back. No. <laughs> what was that? What was the snake's name? I have to know more about this. His name was Jake. He was a he was a beautiful Burmese python. He was gorgeous. He was a beautiful snake. <laughs> and how long do snakes typically live? I am not a snake owner, so I have very little knowledge on this. I would. I think they can live like twenty plus years is it a po- long time is it possible that Jake i mean is still alive? Huge, right i i have no idea i mean he might be i'm old i've been out of the navy for 22 years so <laughs> maybe <laughs> all right fair enough i'm just at sidebar just curious <laughs> so for those animals like jake or like birds it's maybe better to foster out or you know give away the animal versus trying to find a way to move it only to be met with this isn't allowed in this country at all. It's hard because it's, it's like nobody wants to get to, you know, right. to give away a pet. Um, one thing that people should really be considerate of is the fact that you may be able to get it there today. And this is extremely point on for bulldogs. It's English and French bulldogs have such a bad rap in the flight industry, in the airline industry, that <clears throat> we may be able to get them somewhere today. But at the end of your tour, two or three years from now, those policies or those allowances could be completely gone. And it wouldn't be surprising to me. Mm. It, it, and it, and it's, it's hard to say that, but I, you know, if, if I knew I had family who could watch my bulldog, if I had a bulldog and they would, you know, be in a good spot and I was going somewhere like Japan or Korea or to Guam, would I would I be more inclined to leave that animal? Like I absolutely, I would, because I would be fearful that I would get somewhere and then eventually you can't get them out of there. And that is a very real scenario. Right. Right. And you're unlikely to be stationed in one of the places you just mentioned for years and years. They're not typically very long tours unless you make them be there. I mean, there are ways to stay longer if that's what you want, but you know, it's not worth the risk of a dog who you could have in your, as part of your family for, you know, 15 years for two of those years, you're in Japan and that may not be able to bring them home again. If you get them over there, that's a, that's definitely a consideration. My dogs are not in those breed categories, but I can't even imagine the, really the pain would be the only word for it of being faced with that and having to make that decision. So we've been talking about the challenges. We've been talking about the things maybe DOD could do better. What can military families do to advocate for better care and consideration of their pets in the moving process? What steps should they take? Oh, I think what's challenging I see from a military family standpoint is honestly the lack of knowledge of how challenging some breed size can actually be. And so is that something that we, you know, we demand or we expect the military family to know? Or is that something that better can go back to what the leadership can help for military families? So, you know, you were asking that a bit earlier, what can the military do to help and and Mm -hmm. come down to, you know, how can military families advocate better care and consideration? Well, a lot of them don't know that there's going to be a problem with moving their pet until they're ready to move their pet. By that time, the pet's part of the family, right? So I think some of these discussions should come back to the military leadership prior to families or individuals obtaining their pets. Because if this, if these considerations were taken before you adopt or buy or whatever it is, however you obtain an animal to your family, <clears throat> you're not going to have all of these stressors later when you do move. Cause eventually again, you will move. And so I wish I could see something for leadership that's upfront with the facts around uh, talking about pets. And that could be as early as in boot camp and then in military academies and in your tech schools, because we talk with uh, junior soldiers, sailors, Marines, one that we talk with them about um, proper finance and, and, and certain things, but pets are always going to be an integral part of military families. And it should be something that's discussed from leadership from the very beginning of just making people aware that these mm-hmm. scenarios are going to come up and that there should be consideration for types of animals and breeds of animals and sizes of animals just to let them know like, hey, before you decide you're going to get an English Mastiff that could weigh 240 pounds, you may have a very difficult time moving them throughout your military career. Mm-hmm. So that's something that I think 
from the very beginning, uh, military families could really pay attention. And, and again, it's not pay attention. It's just be aware of the fact that there are difficulties in moving some breeds and people just don't know. They don't know. They don't even know that there are going to be costs associated with moving your pet. A lot of military, young military families, they assume that it's covered. So it's not even a, a situation that we you know they're considering when they're buying a pet that is a large animal or when they're adopting an animal that is going to be a restricted breed. It's not a consideration because they just assume the military is going to move that for them. And that's not a fault of the military family. It's to me, it's a fault on the leadership of, you know, just making them aware. Because again, military pets are not something that is in part of the military move. It's not considered something that is essential. But those of us who have animals are absolutely essential to our family. So it's hard, right? It's like, where do you, where does that discussion come into play? And if we can talk about finance, if we can talk about sexually transmitted diseases in boot camp, like we can talk about pets because pets are going to be really important and they're going to be important forever. <laughs> I, that well-played analogy. <laughs> But, but I mean, it, to that date, like, I don't think that's necessarily a stretch. It's kind of funny to compare the two, but they are th- both things that are worth talking about. And they are both issues <laughs> in <laughs> however, to whatever extent you wish they weren't in military. It, they, they're things that we need to discuss and not always are they discussed. So moving <laughs> military pets, can, you know, can be really stressful as we've been talking about. So I'm wondering if you can just maybe leave us in this episode with three or four of your best tips for getting military pets moved with as low stress as possible. I think like I mentioned a bit earlier, it's definitely being prepared. And if that's being prepared in the sense that you've moved your animals yourself multiple times, you know what it is that you're doing, or it's being prepared by diligently doing your research. You know, if you know you're going to be moving to Germany and you do all the work to get your pet there, hey, you're already halfway there. Figure out what it is it's going to take to get your pet home at the same time. Or, you know, reach out to varying pet shippers who are going to handle that process. One of the biggest things, though, that I think are stressors to pet owners, and this is not just military pet owners, it's all pet owners, is that we give animals too many human emotions. And those human emotions that we place on our pets create stress for us. So I hear so often, oh my God, my dog is going to freak out. He hasn't been away from me for 48 hours or my animals never moved before. He's never been on a plane. I say, yeah, they're never going to know they're on a plane. They have no idea. Um, you know, those, you are attributing these, um, emotions to your pet, which in turn creates stress for you. And then that feeds stress to your pet. So one thing that I I wish more pet owners would understand is that animals are extremely resilient. And I mean, when people tell me that their pet is, they're not friendly and they don't like people. And I show them a picture of their pet that comes straight out of their crate and jumps up on my lap. And they're like, huh? And I said, yeah, it's because animals, they're very resilient and particularly dogs that um, fall in line into this pack mentality of, you know what, I don't know what's going on, but you apparently do. You know, when I pick up a pet and I'm like, let's go. And they're like, okay, I may have some hesitation, but most pets are going to do just fine. There are some that do have some anxiety issues, which you know, again, there can be some medication that is allowed for traveling for anxiety and there can be calming devices and calming treats and calming medication that you can do for your pets. But the majority of animals don't need that. It's the owners that need the calming, the calming aids and, you know, the anti-anxiety. And again, that's something when you're working with somebody professionally in the industry, we can kind of help get you through that and really try to help you ease that anxiety. And so That is something that, again, a lot of that anxiety and that stress comes from attributing those um, human emotions to your pets that are unnecessary to, to do so. One of the biggest things that I can say is socialize your pets. And I honestly cannot reiterate that enough. The animals that we do tend to have problems with are going to be dogs that are not socialized and they're not socialized or they don't, they're not properly trained in crate training or walking down a street and and barking at dogs. So if you have a dog that's not properly socialized around other animals, and and they don't have to like other animals, they just have to know that you can't act like a fool around other animals. 
that's where we start to see problems is we'll be at, you know, if we're in an airline and the dog is just acting ballistically crazy because there's another animal that's going to be on that plane and that's going to happen. You're not going to, it's rare that you'll have a plane that your animals are the only animals on that airplane. And so if an animal is acting like that, airline staff are going to be cautious. Like, is this dog going to get out? Is it going to bite us? Is it, are one of our, are one of our handlers going to get injured or is this animal going to break out of the crate on the aircraft and damage our aircraft, which has happened? Um, for United stopped shipping animals in general, they had put a, a restriction on Malinois in general because they had several instances where Malinois busted out of their crate and they were, you know, rummaging around in the aircraft and caused damage to the aircraft. So, you know, having a pet that is socialized and knows how to act in front of other pets, it's really important um, when you are going to be moving. And so again, that comes back to crate training and the importance of crate training. The number of people that come to us, they're trying to travel in three weeks time and their pet's never seen a crate. That's really stressful for the owner. It's stressful for the pet and it can be dangerous for the pet because you could have a pet that's pawing and trying as hard as they can to get out of that crate. So if crate training from the beginning of when you get an animal is, it's not even a training. It's your crate is your home. It is your safe haven. That is something that should be integrated in any pet family. And, and it's not even just for military pets. I mean, people that have their pets crate trained, you may live in the same place in Southern California your whole life, but now all of a sudden wildfires are coming through and you're displaced and your pet's got to be taken with you. If your pet is crate trained and you're able to load them up and now all of a sudden you're in a shelter or you're somewhere that you need to be evacuated or on a military move, you know, right away, you don't have to worry about your animal being as stressed in that situation because they know that when they're in their crate, they're in a safe spot and that the whole world can be crazy. But when I'm here in my confined area, like I'm safe and everything is, everything's going to be okay. I think it's really interesting what you're saying about assigning human emotions to animals, because usually when people say, don't do that, you think, oh, you don't know dogs, but you do know dogs. <laughs> You know animals. So for somebody like yourself who has made this not just their business, but their passion and, and owns animals and loves animals to say there's a difference between what I'm feel when I'm feeling stress and when my animal is feeling stress and when I'm assigning my stress to, to my animal, that's really saying something, I think. And so I mean, I'm definitely guilty of that. We all assign how we're feeling to to our animals, and that's why we love them so much and a lot in a lot of ways because we feel like they understand us and part of that is <laughs> citing them human emotions <laughs> well and they you know and the thing is they give us that unconditional love that you can't get from a person and so you know people feel that and they're just like oh my god my dog absolutely loves me and my dog is going to be super stressed out but you know i have a german shepherd who loves anybody especially if they have a ball and it's like annoying sometimes how much she loves anybody and it's how it is with a lot of animals. I mean, a lot. I think cats probably have the most difficult time in transition and, and traveling. And that's just because that's the nature of cats. And not all cats. I have some cats who are like extremely social. They walk right up to the front of the crate and they're like, meow, 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 and they say hi. But dogs in general, they do. They just do really well. It may take them a couple of days to get, you know, their bearings about them if they're not with their owners. But I think people are honestly extremely surprised. The majority of my clients are very surprised at how easily their pets jump up in our vans when we show up at their house, how easily the pets come right out of the kennels when we pick them up at the quarantine facility. They're, we hear it often like, wow, they're just ready to leave me, huh? And it's, they just, they're just like, let's go. Yeah. And it, well, it's because you nice. probably have treats and you smell like other animals. We definitely that's... smell like other animals. And again, <laughs> We, since we do this every day, and again, that's, that is one thing about using a pet shipper, wherever it is in the world, we don't have that stress. Like we're not feeling stress. Uh, we don't allow our clients to come to the airport with us here in Hawaii. And that's because you're nervous and you're stressed. And I don't want your pet to feel that when mm -hmm. I'm at the airport with your pet, they're not, I'm not stressed. Your pet might be, but the fact that I'm not definitely helps to calm them down. Right. And so, you know, that when I, again, Peck mentality of an animal and authoritative figures to them. It's like, Hey, let's go. And they might look at their mom and they might look at me like, okay, you said, let's go. And the majority of them are ready to go and ready to load up and we're on our way. Yeah. Yeah. 
Carrie, thank you so much for your advice today and for helping us understand this wide world of pet shipping and things that people need to think about as they're getting ready for their own PCSs with their entire family. We really value your time. Thank you so much, Amy, for having me. It's been it's been fun, and I, this is a, it's a passion. It's been my life for the last thirteen years um, as a business, but it's been my life since I was three years old. So a really long time. And I enjoy talking with people about it and spreading the word and, and just sharing that, you know, pet shipping, it's safe. It really is a safe and it's much needed. It, not only is it safe, but it's needed and pets are their family. Thanks so much for listening to PCS with military.com. Want more PCS advice? Check out the rest of PCS with military.com wherever you get your podcasts or visit our PCS Resource Center at military.com forward slash PCS. And until next time, happy moving.